Good start. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session at the Zero Project, uh, where we're going to be looking at a variety of innovative projects focused on reading, storing, telling, and accessible libraries. Uh, my name is Hector Minto. I'm the lead accessibility evangelist for Microsoft. Uh, my role is essentially to drive confidence in accessibility and engage with some of the largest companies around the world on the topic of disability inclusion and accessibility. Uh, and I'm delighted to be back at the Zero Project for what must be my, I'm going to say, fifth time, maybe fourth. Uh, but it's always a delight to come back to Austria and to the Zero Project to see all the amazing global work uh, and global impact that, that they're having. Um, access to reading, access to literature, access to storytelling is a really critical topic. When we think about the stories that we've all learned as children and the bonding moments that we've had, both with our educators, with our parents, living a life without access to literature, without access to storytelling uh, is unthinkable. And yet, this is obviously the experience of so many people around the world with disabilities. Um, of course, as Microsoft, we do as much as we can on accessible formats for text documents, uh, for accessibility checking within our products. But of course, so, many, so much of the content that's created remains inaccessible. Um, we have a general phrase at Microsoft that if you don't know if it's accessible, pause. It's not, uh, because accessibility is always deliberate. It doesn't happen by accident. And so that's why I'm particularly delighted to be joined by a number of key projects, or great projects, focusing on this, on this critical topic. The other thing I'll just make a comment on as well is the, the challenge of scaling accessibility. Accessibility, again, doesn't happen by accident, but also is only really the reserve of a niche audience within society. We've got to work harder uh, as citizens in every country that we represent, to skill everybody up on accessibility. Everybody should know how a blind person accesses an email. Everybody should know how somebody who uses sign language can facilitate that in a call. Uh, and if we don't focus on that knowledge piece in society, then, then we won't make the progress that we need to. And so the other thing I'd like you to focus on when we listen to these amazing projects that, that we'll focus on today is how can we use our libraries, our centers within society, these key institutions that exist in education, in civil society, but also in the workplace. Major employers around the world employ librarians to focus on the, on the learning needs of their employees around the world. If we don't get this group to know about reasonable accommodations, assistive technology, whether content is accessible or not, or when barriers are unnecessarily put up, then we're missing out on an amazing audience who frankly care about equal access. I've, I'm yet to meet an, a librarian who will not make an amazing recommendation on content about what we need in terms of our, our leisure, our learning, our skills. And so, putting real focus on innovative practices and scaling this message of accessibility through our libraries, I, I genuinely couldn't be more excited about. And I, and I look forward to connecting with all of you after this session today. I just want to tell a, a short story. Uh, I used to work for a, a very innovative tech company. Not that Microsoft's not a very innovative tech company, but I used to work for an even more innovative tech company, I'll say, uh, in the field of assistive technology. Um, and we worked with eye tracking. Uh, now, eye tracking was focused on speech and computer access, but we started using it for storytelling with some of the most disabled children in the world, uh, looking at what their eyes were looking at while we read stories to them. So while parents were connecting with their children, with books in front of them on the computer screen, we were able to see where the child was looking, and it created genuinely beautiful moments. Uh, we should never uh, focus only on function. Storytelling, access to literature, is as much about relationship building and love as it is about anything else. And so please, when you listen to these, uh, these, these speakers today, have a think about what they're developing here, not just in terms of the functionality that it delivers, but in the relationships that it helps people to bond with. Uh, technology is only good if it actually has a positive outcome. Functionality for functionality's sake is not anything I'm interested in. Uh, and so I hope, as you get to know some of our speakers today, uh, you look at some of the actual human impact some of these uh, technologies can potentially have. Okay, certainly enough from me. Uh, the format of this session, we're going to give each person uh, four minutes. I think we're agreeing on four minutes uh, to, present their, uh, to present their projects. Uh, we will then break into uh, an open conversation with myself 
and then we will open up to questions from the audience. So, I'd like to turn to Carla first, who is online and joining us online. Carla, are you there? Hello. Hey. Uh, hey. You have four minutes. Please begin. Uh, hello, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank the Zero Project community for this recognition and congratulate my panel colleagues. My name is Carla Mausch and I am the founder of uh, and general manager of Mais Diferenças. Next, please. We are a Brazilian nonprofit organization based in Sao Paulo, founded in 2005. We investigate, produce, and share experience and knowledge regarding inclusive education and culture, dedicating ourselves to accessibility and universal design. We stand for the right of people with disabilities to autonomy and equal opportunities. We work with and not for people with disabilities and believe that this is how it should be done. Next, please. We commit ourselves to development of audiovisual books in multiple accessible formats that bring together several accessibility resources such as text, narration, audio description, Libras, Brazilian Sign Language, easy reading, original animation, and soundtracks. We offer complementary solutions such as guidelines and supportive materials that amplify the reader's experience, suggesting different ways to read with the aid of accessibility resources in inclusive environments like classrooms and reading sessions. Next, please. We created more than 70 books in multiple formats with a series of combinations and different resources. Our inter interdisciplinary and inclusive team is composed of people without and with different kinds or kinds of disabilities with different ages and that read in many ways. Since our practice is based on inclusive premises and on the principles of universal design, it also benefits people who've had little or no access to literature texts as well as the elderly and people who have Portuguese and as a second language. Our books have reached more than 500,000 with views impacting many people. Next, please. Now, I'm going to present a sample from the book In Cima Daquela Serra by Elkanã Ferraz and Yara Kono, published by Companhia das Letras in the program Leia para uma Criança. Read to a child in Portuguese. We are very proud that we have been granted this award and very glad to be sharing this with you today. I hope you enjoy it. May there always be new books and new readers. Thank you. You can play it, please. Checking in with our AV team, are we playing the sample? Oh. Oh. One moment, Carla. What a pity. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. No, no, no luck. Great. Carla, if you could send us the link in the chat to the content, uh, and we One will moment. replay it when we come to the Q&A later. Is that okay? Okay. When we get to the question section later, we'll, we'll, we'll try again to replay it. Okay, so my next question to the AV team is, uh, is Pablo on the call from Argentina? No? No? Okay, good. So we're going to move now to Christopher in the room. Christopher, your four minutes. 
begin now. Hello, I'm Dr. Christopher Kurz. I'm a professor at RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, and I have my colleague here, Dr. Tommy Sarche, who is assistant dean at RIT, and she is voicing for me today. Really, we want to talk about our project called World Around You, or WAY. That project has a platform that includes an online digital library. And within that library, we have a lot of content that is deaf-centered. What does it mean to be deaf-centered? It means that we've collected feedback from deaf communities about how the importance of linking sign language to reading. To be deaf-centered feedback means that our design is based on all of our digital library content being deaf-centered. It is very important for deaf children to have storybooks that are accessible in two languages to help them develop their reading and writing skills, both in written language and in sign language. We really want all of our libraries to be accessible to deaf children around the globe. There are approximately 34 million deaf children around the globe, but only 2% out of that 34 million have access to their own language. That really means that 98% of deaf children have no access to language. So really, our project is really designed to address that significant problem. So why is Way Innovatum? One way that it's innovative is that it is an open source platform. It's open license to anyone who wants to modify and adapt storybooks to your own country's context. Another innovative component of this uh, platform is that it is crowdsourced. And so we actually bring together communities of signers, illustrators, and authors together in order to, order to create the storybook content. And then once the stories are completed, they are published onto our platform. A third innovative component is that our ebook format actually has the sign language in a separate window from the text. Therefore, the user or reader has a control over the pacing of the story, changing pages, and they don't have to try to split between reading and seeing the sign language at the same time. You know, YouTube has a lot of stories available online, and they're captioned using sign language, but it's difficult cognitively because you have to try to attend to both the text and the sign language at the same time. However, with our Way platform, uh, the user can choose whether to read or to follow the sign language. And we also have a glossary built into our platform. So key terminologies from the stories that are highlighted, a user can click on that content and that get an expanded definition in sign language and a visual illustration. We also have an innovation where we allow all of our storybooks to be exported in EPUB format, and then it can be read offline. And so it can be used with any ebook reader, both with sign language and the text, and each page is represented in the EPUB format. And we feel that that is another innovative aspect of our project. Our long-term goal is really to expand that online library so that it can be translated into many different languages through crowdsourcing uh, the material from communities. And lastly, we also um, have all of our videos that are done by deaf adults who are experts in sign language. We do not use interpreters. Oftentimes, those interpreters are second language learners of sign language. And so deaf people, this is their natural native language that they've passed down. And so they can naturally interpret these stories much better. And so we work very closely with deaf communities to in, uh, ensure that the interpretation is accurate. Currently, we are partnered with six countries in Southeast Asia, and we have over 300 stories built into our library. The users, that are the children and parents, uh, deaf community members, all of them can access the story. Over 7,000 people are using our tools now. We also have 
39 books that are specifically talking about stories with deaf characters because we want that opportunity for deaf children to see role models who are people like them. Many story books do not have deaf characters or if they do have a story about a deaf character, it's the kind of we need to fix them because they're deaf. But no, these are positive stories about deaf people who are just human with the same range of emotions and experiences from humor to sad or angry and all of that those types of experiences are in our stories. And so we're very excited about this and we're looking forward to partnering with other uh, countries to further expand our library. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, hello, thank you very much indeed for the introduction and of course for the um, zero project uh, of having awarded this uh, initiative of the easy uh, dictionary um, if you go to the presentation uh, what I would like to share with you is what the easy dictionary is uh, when we look into the dictionaries the usual dictionaries we find that there are many barriers for people for with reading difficulties go to the next slide Is this? Uh, I think it doesn't work. Uh, no, thank you. Um, if we find it, if we look into, for instance, the word tolerance in English, as or it is in Spanish tolerancia in the picture, uh, what is the uh, the definition? the action of being tolerant, which is not very helpful for people with reading difficulties. So uh, we found this problem, we found the trouble that uh, common dictionaries are not useful for people with reading difficulties. And then uh, what we... What we propose a solution is uh, the Easy Dictionary, which is under the dominion www.dictionaryoffacil.org. It's only in Spanish, but uh, the technology is very transferable for um, all kinds of languages because uh, the, uh, the idea inside behind that is uh, to understand what uh, certain words and expressions are in very simple definitions. Um, our goal is to translate, to make easier the comprehension of low frequency words, polysemic words, technical words, or even expressions. We uh, don't look only into, into words, but also expressions, because some words uh, have different senses if we uh, interact with other words. So expressions are also part of the, uh, of the solution. And how do we choose these uh, words and expressions? Well, actually, we have three sources. Uh, easy to read publication, in which there are certain definitions of uh, difficult words that people find in their readings. Uh, the second one is the alerts that the own technology produces when there, there is a wrong search. Uh, and then we receive an alert to, to learn what people are looking for uh, in, the, in the dictionary, but it is not still uploaded. And finally, direct messages uh, through uh, a form, a contact form that we have in the, in the easy dictionary. And what do you find? Uh, currently, you find up to three definitions. Uh, this is the maximum that we have uh, designed in easy to read. And an example of use and a picture when it helps. Why do we use an example of use? Because sometimes when we uh, write the definition in easy to read, it is not clear enough because some uh, words are very technical or abstract and they need how to apply in the reality in sentences. Then uh, it is common that people and users say, uh, I understand the definition, but when I find the example of use, I really understand what it means. And the picture, uh, it is depending on, uh, on the word. It functions, it works very good uh, with uh, concrete words, uh, but not so much with abstract ones. So uh, 
testing is very important, as I'm going to, to clear up now, uh, because we have three roles behind the Easy Dictionary. They are the translators that write the definitions in Easy to Read, and then the validators. Validators are people and users uh, with reading difficulties. In our case, as I am representative of an organization of people with intellectual disabilities, we work with people with intellectual disabilities, and the validators uh, check the comprehension of those definitions that translators upload in the system. And finally, uh, there, is a, there, uh, there is a third role that philologists. Uh, we, we find, uh, we find uh, very necessary the balance between comprehension and uh, correction in grammar and, uh, and, and spelling. So, uh, because the interaction is natural in the, in the language. And what do we apply as a methodology? Uh, easy to read. Easy to read is a, is a way of writing uh, to ease to ease contents, uh, written contents for people with reading difficulties. It has a, it's a two-step methodology. It has a, the guidelines to, to write and design, and secondly, the uh, check, uh, the testing of, of this uh, written content into easy to read with these guidelines with end users that are trained uh, end users because it's not simple uh, uh, a trial with uh, anybody uh, with reading difficulties, but with people that are trained for that purpose. And this is how it works. So, as you see, uh, we detect the, the trouble, the word, and then uh, the roles interact in this workflow. Firstly, the translator uh, write the definition, and then there is a first validators group, usually four or five people with intellectual disabilities, coordinated by a facilitator, and then they propose the changes if necessary. In the middle of that, there is a foundation uh, which is very related to, to language, the Fundeu Rai in Spain, and uh, they prove, they check that the grammar is, uh, is right, and there is a second validation with another different group from the first one, and finally, uh, the publication. In all steps, translator interact uh, in all steps uh, in order to check uh, the definition and include the changes if necessary. This is uh, the home page. It looks like a search engine, very, very well known for everybody, but uh, we think that simple uh, in this case is what is more useful for everybody. And then you have the definitions, for instance, in this case, boat. Uh, it has two definitions. As you see, there is a definition with an example and a picture, and the second one don't have picture, doesn't have picture. So, this is the kind of uh, definitions that you get uh, in the dictionary. And that this is the intranet, because for the workflow, we have an intranet behind that. And as you see, uh, there is a technology for interaction between uh, all roles uh, involved in the development of the dictionary. Our achievement, we have 12 validation groups, around 50 people with intellectual disabilities working as validators for this, this, this dictionary. We have a balance between comprehension and correction and a wide dissemination in Latin America. We had uh, around uh, two, 12 million visits, 75% uh, from Latin America. Uh, so uh, it is interesting uh, because there is, uh, we have found a need, a real need, and we are covering this need. And finally, a way to stabilize the validation as an employment alternative, because we would like that this validation will, will become a real employment for people with intellectual uh, disabilities. I would like to close my presentation with two acknowledgement. First one, to all the organization involved uh, 14 organizations involved in the validation of the dictionary and uh, three uh, good friends and uh, um, very important women behind the, uh, this dictionary, the heart, the brain and the hands as I stress them uh, because the heart, Eva was the beginner, uh, Anna was the mastermind behind the, the solution and Elena is uh, our translator I wish you all translator. So uh, thank you very much for, for them because they make possible the, that the dictionary, the easy dictionary, become as a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, that was excellent. Uh, and I learned two new Spanish words that I, I did not know before. So <laughs> very good. Uh, OK, uh, we're going to check online to see if Alana from Benetech is available.
I am. Hey, Alana. Yes, I am. Great to see Hi. you and hear you. Uh, okay, your, your four minutes start now. Excellent. Hi, my name is Elena Ladone from Benetech, calling in from uh, the west coast of the United States. Um, can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so I'm represent Benetech is um, an organization that produces uh, the Bookshare platform. So Bookshare is the world's uh, largest platform and an ebook library for people with reading barriers or print disabilities, as um, as it's often called, uh, blindness low vision, dyslexia, or certain mobility impairments. And um, to the to the point earlier, there are so many fantastic content creators around the world, from the other folks on this panel to thousands of publishers um, and, and other creators. And Bookshare helps amplify and distribute those books in accessible formats for people with reading barriers. So we have over a million, well over a million titles on the platform. Those titles are each in multiple accessible formats, um, and we have distributed millions of books to people across the globe to read in a way that works for them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so speaking of classic stories, um, a, a beautiful story like The Little Prince um, is, is in, our, in our platform um, in multiple accessible formats. So we, we do source books in many languages. Uh, we offer them in audio, DAISY, um, Braille, ready format, EPUB, and Word. And they're able to be read on commonly used devices, phones, computers, tablets, as well as assistive technology devices. So the, the goal is to allow people to read um, in the language they need, in the uh, format they need, on the device that they have, you know, anywhere, anytime. Um, to, to the point about, about scale, we're, we're really trying to reach people all, all around the world um, to read in what's comfortable, in a way that's comfortable for them. Next slide, please. Next. Ah, there we go. So um, stories are fantastically important, and I, I'm so excited to, to see the example of, of, the, of the stories um, produced by the other panelists. Uh, we also, in addition to facilitating those stories being uh, shared around the world, we, we also focus on some of the other types of content like STEM or um, text material. And, and some of those accessibility challenges are, are quite real um, to be able to facilitate uh, math equations, charts, graphs uh, becoming accessible. So we're using artificial intelligence and machine learning to improve um, that conversion process and help turn math that might be read as an image on the page in a book into a math ML or um, a usable format that can be audible by a screen reader um, or used, used in other ways. Uh, so between char um, STEM, working on STEM, making that more accessible as well as um, facilitating just the, the conversion process of, of any type of content on a page um, in, in the hopes that, that we can make sure all, that all content is, is available. I really appreciate um, Carla's point about uh, the right of people to access information, and, and that's what we're, we're trying to facilitate here. Next slide, please. Uh, to, to the point, again, about scalability, um, we really appreciate all the work that content creators do to not only produce the content that they produce, but efforts to make that content accessible right from the source. And, and Benetech helps, helps facilitate that with, with training, um, awareness raising, and an actual certification program. And um, my colleague's actually going to speak about that at a fireside chat maybe tomorrow. Uh, but this is something that, that we're... Uh, expanding around the world to support people who want to to make their content accessible and and, and not wait um, for that content to be maybe converted by other vendors but but to have it as, as a core part of what they do next slide and just speaking of partnership um, the the ecosystem of accessible materials is, is sort of small and huge at the same time. Um, so these are some of our, our many partners who 
um, produce content, who work with us to distribute content, anywhere from STEM textbooks to beautiful storybooks. And uh, we're always excited. We really appreciate the partnerships that we have and are, and are always looking to, to expand the, the number and type of organizations that we work with uh, to distribute material in accessible formats. I think that's my last slide. Next, next one, just to make sure. Okay. Yes. Thanks Thank so you. much, Elena. Thank you. Uh, okay, and we're now going to check to see if Pablo has managed to join us. No? Okay, good. So we're now going to turn to the open conversation part of the, part of the session. Um, I've got a number of questions for, for each of you. Carla, if I could just turn to you first. Um, how much does culture matter, or, or how much of the driver behind what you're doing is the, is the preserving of culture? Obviously, in an increasingly connected world, regional sign language is something that could easily start to be impacted by online materials being available in different formats. So how much of that is a, is a driver for you? Hello, I'm Thais. I'm helping Carla with the English part. <laughs> okay. uh, could, you, could you please repeat your question, yeah, please? And I, yeah, and I will slow down. I speak far too quickly. I'm sorry. Thank uh, you. So I'm interested in, in the, the driver of culture for you as an organization. How important is it to you in, an, in a connected world to preserve local sign language and impact your local audience? porque principalmente no Brasil tem muito pouco material, então a gente conta que tem surdos uhum. que fazem a tradução, então acho que a gente tem um compromisso grande de preservar, ou mais do que de preservar, acho que de amplificar e disseminar, e Sim. que a gente trabalha nessa interface entre educação e cultura. Mais diferenças works a lot in this inter interconnection between education and culture. So for us, it's very important to work with uh, Brazilian Sign Language because there is such a small offer of uh, materials in the language, uh, especially uh, literature texts. So for us, it is a way to promote the language, to disseminate it, include, including to people who, uh, who don't have hearing disability and to offer the, the, the content and to promote access to literature to people, to deaf people. So for us, it's a core action of my differences. And we've, we've just been told that your video is now available to play. So perhaps to illustrate some of that local culture, we could play that video. That would be great. Em cima daquela serra passa boi, passa boiada. Mm. Na serra, os bois dão voltas, avançando pela estrada. Tem uma cerca quebrada, tem uma pomba pousada. Uma cerca de madeira, onde a pomba está parada. Em cima daquela serra, passa uma vaca malhada. A vaca passa pela cerca. A vaca é branca e tem uma mancha preta. A pomba lhe dá uma olhada. Very nice. That's great. Thank Just you for comment. that. Uh, sorry. Just to make a comment. So uh, in the in this excerpt from the book, you can see that the person, the audios are different. So uh, the person who's narrating the text is one, yep. and the person who does the audio description is another. It also changes the sign language interpreters. The first one uh, that narrates the test, the text, is a interpreter, Brazilian sign language interpreter. And the person who's translating to, to Brazilian sign language, the description is a deaf person. So we make these changes to make it clear in the text when we're, do, when we're narrating the story and when it's the audio description. 
e que tem outras versões mais detalhadas. Então, não é a única, por exemplo, de audiodescrição. Mm -hmm. é so, this is one version of the audiovisual book, but we have many versions, uh, ones with uh, a larger description and less poetic, like this one yeah. that tries to, to context to the story. Another ou só a língua de sinais e narração. And only sign language narration. There are lots of uh, uh, different ways to access this story. I Thank you. I, I think it's a wonderful example of thinking beyond functional, which I said at the start. It's this idea that assistive technology moving forward should not just be a functional replacement of the of the text uh, or of the story, but should be designed as a as a deaf culture experience, uh, which I think brings us really nicely to your work, Christopher. Uh, you know, I, I, I genuinely, before I started to work for Microsoft, I, was, I wasn't fully aware of the concept of deaf culture uh, and was perhaps way too focused on designing functional experiences for people with disabilities. What role do organizations such as yourself play in preserving deaf culture and actually supporting some of the global deaf culture projects that we see here? Thank you. So, uh, like others have mentioned, our platform is really deaf-centered. And to talk about what that means, it means we have a lot of analysis and re evidence-based research on how deaf children learn language, and two languages in particular, learning how to read and learning how to sign. And so we've developed a large corpus of data uh, from international communities. So deaf people from the Philippines who have a lot of experience Experience teaching deaf children have shared their data with us and worked with us in helping to establish our design. And then also with other people who work with designing books and how, what should be attractive and interesting to deaf children is another element that we've incorporated. So really the implementation of our project first was a proof of concept. And then we actually did some field testing in the Philippines with deaf children in schools to gather more of their feedback on how did what the deaf people's perceptions about uh, the stories was the culture really incorporated into the stories and also understand that deaf culture has a lot of variation as well there's not one deaf culture and so we wanted to make sure that we want to make it clear that this is really matching your particular culture and your particular community and accessible for their children and and, and one more quick question on this. The, the narrator plays an incredibly important role in every story. Yeah? When we think of Dickens or Shakespeare, you know, we, we know that, the, the, that that's coming through a particular set of biases, a particular lens of society. Uh, obviously, the narrator is going to be a hugely important person moving forward, so I'm really pleased to see you're doing that kind of work. Yes, you're right. And... That's why we feel that it's very important that deaf children have access to native signers in their own language, that mm. from their own local communities. There's not many deaf children in general who have access to those people. And so our platform way is really allowing deaf children to see that sign a signer might be from another town over or another community. And, uh, and then I can see how deaf are capable as storytellers and really develop that sense of we are both deaf. We have this many things that are same and can connect in that way. But another thing that we find very interesting, and I know this might be a little bit of an uh, odd perspective, but some of the stories have been developed by deaf people. They are actually the authors and creators of the stories because we want to show that uh we presented that information at a conference in the uh, Philippines. We wanted to show deaf authors from the Philippines and deaf signers and deaf artists all came together in order to create that particular story. So we showed that story at the conference and it was said it was all made by a deaf team of artists and creators and several of the teachers in the audience says, oh, this can't be, it can't be. 
And I said, really? They said, Deaf can write a story? And I said, absolutely. And so really, that was some of that changing people's uh, perceptions about what de Deaf people are capable of accomplishing. And so through this platform, we're trying to further promote and expose all people to understand that Deaf really are capable, and that hopefully teachers will con continue to prom promote that positive mindset. So I am from Microsoft, so I have to ask some questions about the technology itself. Um, I, I'm particularly interested in artificial intelligence and where we're going with AI, sign language. And is there a, I don't want to ask a, a leading question, but I worry sometimes that most of the data that's already there on sign language is the news. It's the, it's the existing content fed into the model. Uh, I love the idea that your project will actually start to feed different AI in, different data into the, into the models that are going to do uh, automated sign language in the future. Yes, um, as Tommy and I, um, we work at Rochester Institute of Technology, as I mentioned, and we actually have projects uh, working on using artificial intelligence into translated into ASL using avatars. Uh, but there's a lot of research that is showing that we're not sure exactly where AI is going um, because there's some nuances in sign language that are often hard to capture with AI technology. Even though you might have the language in the grammar and so when this project that we've been working with in other countries there's a lot of um, those countries have very little documentation of their existing sign language and there's a risk of those languages dying out so part of this effort is also preserving and documenting the written and sign languages and translating it to preserve the language mm -hmm. and deaf leaders in those deaf teams have been discussing how to translate the language and there's a lot of issues related to the linguistic aspects. So for example, a story might have a concept that exists in text, uh, but, it, but that particular story doesn't work in that culture. The word may not exist in the spoken language or in the sign language to exactly match that concept. So we to have a lot of discussions about how do we describe that concept accurately to produce the story. And if AI were to come into the picture, how is that a barrier as well? And how would AI be used to solve that kind of linguistic problem. So I'm very interested in seeing how AI can be applied, but I think there's also still a lot more work to be done. I think it's absolutely right. AI has to reflect real human experiences, and, and we risk, we're always at risk uh, of getting that wrong. Okay, so turning to, the, to, to your project, uh, Oscar, um, I, I, I'm super interested in it uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I, I just, it feels to me like great inclusive design. There are many people in society with lower levels of literacy who, who are not being diagnosed with a learning disability as such, who would need this kind of technology. So the question is, how are you scaling it? How are you getting the message out there that, that it exists in Spain? Well, actually, um, our dictionary has increased the number of words that are available from the launch about around 1,000, and we have uh, now around 3,500 published mm -hmm. and 2,000 else uh, in progress. So we expect yeah. that we can finish uh, th this year uh, with more around more than 5,000 words published, mm -hmm. words and expressions. And actually, uh, the how was it spread? Uh, it was spread, I think, because it has a very good SEO, uh, very, good, very good strategy mm -hmm. in, search, in search engines because uh, we were amazed of the answer from visitors. Uh, the results uh, show that we have not only uh, around two th uh, 12, 000, uh, 12 million visits, but uh, they are uh, uh, around three minutes mm -hmm. Uh, visiting the the website, so it shows that uh, people expect a lot, and people are interested in the answer that we are providing to, for them. And uh, as I said, we haven't uh, done any communication, especially to Latin America, but. 75% of uh, of the visits come from there. So 
there is actually a, a need uh, and the answer is the easy dictionary. And, and sorry, just applying a technical lens to this. Of course. How far are we away from an API where you could install it on your website so that it automatically picked up language that it knew was going to be in your dictionary? Well, uh, that's in our uh, in our list of wishes <laughs> wish list. Actually, it's, a, it's an obvious one. We 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 have a lot we have a lot of uh, wishes about the easy dictionary because we have discovered that uh, it's a, a real tool, an inclusive tool, and it needs to. Uh, be developed in many ways, and one of them is the this API included in the in the website, so that, for instance, uh, when you go into uh, a, a website and you uh, check into the Easy Dictionary tool, for instance, uh, toolbar, then it highlights the words that uh, are included exactly. in the it's a dictionary. Well, yes, that, that's, uh, that's an idea that we have. Uh, we are, of course, interested in creating uh, new corpora uh, cooperation and sponsors for that. And uh, of course, uh, cooperation is always welcome uh, <laughs> to, I, I, to increase the, the, this, this project. I like how you've turned that back on me. That's very good. Okay, okay. you're <laughs> Happy to talk to you of after course. this. Um, okay, Elena, uh, just bringing you in on the call, um, just a quick, nod to the work Benetech's done on the rigor on accessibility. I, you know, it's, it's very easy in many of these projects to ignore the use of screen reader users, not ignore, but to miss it. If you're focused purely on, on the reading and the literacy side of things, then maybe we miss some of the more rigorous aspects of assistive technology. So just kudos for, the, for that amazing Thank work. You. Um, one thing I'd like to focus on you actually is on this skills economy. Uh, you've managed to understand quite quickly not quite quickly, you've been around a little while, but the, 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 the STEM agenda uh, is a challenge. The workplace is going to be increasingly digital. Lifelong learning is going to be an issue in terms of the, the digital skills economy. So could you maybe just share a little bit more on how you, how you added this to your kind of initial story, storybooks aspect and reading to more of the kind of the skilling agenda? And, and is that leading to new relationships with, with, uh, with businesses? Um, great question. So, uh, yes, it is leading to new relationships with businesses, maybe more in the in the nascent stage, as well as some amazing um, NGOs um, in the U.S. and India that have have always focused on skill development and adding, you know, bookshare content that um, is has. Uh, has a, a lot of focus on STEM and is accessible in STEM is is kind of a, a, an ad addition to to the work that they're doing. So, we um, yes, we have been around for, for a long time and and have have always uh, has have always focused on text and the. I mean, it was just a natural evolution, right? You don't you don't want to read a book and and have uh, have a, a textbook for a student that says please see the equation below to solve it and then that equation for a screen reader just says image because it's not described or tagged or um, made accessible in any way um, so it was um, it's just imperative that mm. that we figure out a way to to make sure that that those equations are able to be read aloud to a student using a screen reader or described in a way that displays the equation but of, you know of course doesn't give the answer um, <laughs> yeah sorry. and and that you know that can be an image or it can be in line right if if you're reading and and that that dash is that a dash or a minus sign um, to figure that out as a um, when you're Converting a book into an accessible format is something that is something that we're also working on. Um, so I think I mean just the statistics about people with disabilities who pursue STEM education and STEM careers. There's a disparity, of course, between um, the general population and and you know in the U.S. we we uh, the general population even maybe needs a little bit of a, a boost for STEM as well. So mm. we're really excited to to make. To make our books more accessible in that way, um, and then of course, like I uh, mentioned in the slide, is is when publishers create books and and other materials, not not just books, but but any material that they create, to have that material be to be accessible, right? Like we can convert the STEM equation into MathML um, from that image, but even better if it's already uh, described or um, written out. 
when the book is is published in the first place. So we're we're really excited to pursue those two angles simultaneously to tackle the the problem in a more holistic way. That's great. Thanks. And and. and I would describe it almost as like the final frontier for accessibility is that we still don't have good standardized ways of describing graphics, uh, describing infographics. So yeah, really keen to keep an eye on the work that you're doing here. Okay, um, we've only got a minute and a half left and there's not many too many people here live in the room, but we do have some questions. So uh, if I could just ask you to press your button on your thing and ask, and ask a question. Yeah, I am Antonio Martinez Pujalto from Spain. Uh, in I want to uh, make, uh, to make a, a short comment and a question to Oscar. Uh, in these days, uh, a bill is, is being passed in Spanish Parliament which recognizes for the first time cognitive accessibility and easy reading. Uh, and that's a very important, I think it's very important, it's only a first step, but it's a very important step because uh, easy language and uh, uh, cognitive accessibility are going to be recognized yeah. legally for the Fantastic. first time in Spain. Uh, my question, mm, uh, connecting with that, my question is, do you think, Oscar, that uh, this uh, can be also a source of employment for persons with intellectual disabilities? Because uh, easy reading needs always validators, which are persons with intellectual disabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And, and Paul, can we take your question at the same time, just in case other people have to drop off? Well, actually, hi. My name is Paul from Kubito. There you go. Not really. Do you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Um, well, actually, Kubito, I think Oscar, our people are in Dutch. We have the API already you're needing, ready. Maybe Hector, we speak about getting it on Asia. I, I, feel a, I feel a bar conversation coming on later at Zero Project. So do, and to the colleague over there, that what would be my question as well. How aware is, are the government agencies in Spain that this could be a solution for so many problems mm. in the governmental sector? That would be my question. Truly inclusive design, I agree. Uh, Oscar, I'm going to have to dash off my, my other panel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so the floor is yours, and uh, thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much for both questions. First one, uh, yes, of course, I am work, uh, we are working in Plenitud in Madrid for, for that purpose of, uh, so that uh, validation become a real pro uh, professional way uh, because we are working in a European Erasmus Plus project uh, specifically uh, focused on that purpose. So develop a curriculum for uh, for people with intellectual disabilities as validators. And secondly, uh, Niels, uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, yes, uh, we are uh, an, an intellectual disabilities organization. Support We support the rights of people with intellectual disabilities, but we are aware that this solution, easy to read, is not exclusive for people with intellectual disabilities, but for a third of the population that have uh, these reading difficulties, elderly, uh, migrants, many people that uh, can have these difficulties, but uh, we consider that easy to read is a key for accessibility for our, uh, uh, for our group and that it is a way of employment in that way of, of validation. But we don't consider at all that easy to read is exclusive. No, no, no. It's a way of including people with intellectual disabilities in society. Thank you.